I think it was, I want to do this and this is what I'm getting, beat it and I'll do the deal. And, and they, they've beaten it and it's, you know, if you're Ferrari, it's not difficult to beat any deal that is on the table from another team. And that's what they've done. They basically just increased it in every area. But ultimately it was Lewis wanting to go to, go to Ferrari and just have a change of scenery and breathe different air. Who are they to say? Who are they to judge whether the Andretti name or the Formula One name is bigger and who needs which more? Who, who, how can anybody put themselves in that position to make that judgment? It's, uh, it's completely wrong to do that because Andretti is an integral part of the sport and we wouldn't have the Formula One we have today if it wasn't for drivers like Mario Andretti. That is an absolute fact. Money is just, it's just a currency. It's just a, it's just a convenience. It's not, not a goal, it's not an end goal at all. Uh, it's not in any way a substitute for the feeling a driver can get if he's just put together the ultimate pole lap or a team owner can have if he has plucked a young guy out of karting and put him into Formula 3 and he goes straight into Formula 1 and he's super quick in his third race, second race, first race. That, those feelings, those human emotions are ultimately what our sport is all about. If you're a betting man, Peter, where, where's your money going between Charles and Lewis for next year? Hello and welcome to another F1 Hour with me, my friend, your friend, the GOAT F1 broadcaster slash analysis, Mr. Peter D. Windsor. How are you doing, sir? It's been a bit of a busy week, eh? Cameron, yeah, we we it was pretty quiet for a while, wasn't it? And then everything's broken loose uh, for 2025, bizarrely, but uh, it's, or 26 it's, in the case of, or not in the case of uh, Andretti. But uh, yeah, so much going on there. It's given us a bit to talk about, hasn't it? Should we address Lewis Hamilton? I'll, I'll pitch the question at you this way, Peter: Has yeah. Sir Lewis Carl Davidson Hamilton made the right decision? to jump ship from Mercedes and go to Ferrari in 2025? Well, obviously, if he's at Ferrari in 25 and George Russell is world champion for Mercedes, everyone's going to say it was the wrong decision, including Lewis. But uh, on the, you know, the, the odds of that happening, I think, are fairly small. Let's put it that way. And I think where he is now, it's a very good decision. I, I really do. I think... If he was a young guy and it was his fourth year in Formula One or something, you'd you'd be questioning it because you'd say, well, you know, give Mercedes an opportunity, they're going to come back, as George Russell would be saying. But from where Lewis sits, you know, he's been around a while, he's won seven championships, he's been there, done that kind of thing, and he's had this massive thing in, in his life ever since Abu Dhabi 21 and a, and a lot of other stuff that's happened since then, you know, the George replacing Valtteri and uh, and... and the car being very average by Mercedes standards and having to do all that stuff for two years. Not, I can't imagine he's really enjoyed himself that much, to be honest. And I think he's just saying, back end of my career, I'm going to go to Ferrari. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy everything I love about Italy and Ferrari and red overalls and, and just go there and see what happens. And I don't think he's saying, I've got to, you know, I'm going to make that a championship winning team. And, you know, if it doesn't win, it's a terrible mistake. I think he's going to go there in a pretty lighthearted way, by which I mean he's going to enjoy his racing. And I think it's, you know, where else would be better than that at Ferrari? Let's face it. It's a good shout, Peter. And I think the best way I've heard it termed, I mean, there's no guarantees of, of anyone, even Max Verstappen, being, a, being in a car capable of winning the championship in any, any given year, right? And the way I've heard it termed um, best, if if there are no guarantees, if you're going to lose in a car, then why not do it in the red car, right? If <laughs> well, yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. I mean, there have been drivers losing in red cars who have not found it fun at all. And of course, if you're not going well at Ferrari, there's always the the media and all the political pressure that comes with it. So I don't think it's the, it's the most comfortable of teams not to be winning races with. But having said that, from Lewis's point of view, he doesn't need to prove anything. So uh, he'll enjoy it. I mean, I suppose, you know, the biggest drama will be if it is a good car and Charles Leclerc is whipping him in every race, every qualifying session. But then even then Lewis is going to say, well, you know, I'm enjoying my life. I'm going to win some races soon, head down, get on with it. And he will, he'll win races if, if Charles is. So yeah, I think he, I think he'll be fine. Talk to me, Peter, about Charles and Lewis as a dynamic 
in 2025 because again this this feels like um one of the principal narratives um Charles fans will obviously say that listen Lewis is over the hill and Charles is gonna give him a good hiding and Lewis fans will say well Lewis is right there and he's probably more complete of a driver than Charles who still makes some mistakes most notably at France and Las Vegas this year just gone um if you're a betting man Peter where, where's your money going between Charles and Lewis for next year? Well, I'd just like to answer the first part of the question about the dynamic, first of all. because It's an interesting question because if, if, if Toto Wolff said to Lewis, I'm going to, I want to, this is before he'd gone to Ferrari, before he started to leave, I want to, I want to give you a long term contract. You are the future of Mercedes. If we're going to win championships again, Lewis, it's going to be with you. We're going to fire George Russell at the end of 24. You can choose the other driver. We want this whole team to be around you. Lewis will probably go for Valtteri or somebody like that. Maybe Carlos Sainz, maybe, you know, somebody who's going to be there. Maybe Sergio Perez, for example, somebody who's going to do what, you know, Perez has let Max do. That's what Lewis, that's the perfect situation for a driver like Lewis. But bearing in mind, he's not in that situation anyway at Mercedes. He's got George in the other car, who's a, who's a very different animal to Valtteri in that sense. Then he's probably just given up any thought of being in that situation and he's going to Ferrari. And obviously, you know, if you're Max, you don't want Charles in the other car. If you're Lewis, you don't want Max in the other car. If you're Charles, you don't want Lewis or Max. But he's going there with Charles. And so a lot of people would say, well, you know, he, he, he had, had George and now he's got, going, got Charles, but he's not going there. He's going there for different reasons. And he's driving at Ferrari with a different outlook. And it'll be Lewis Hamilton goes to Ferrari. He'll do the best job he can. He'll be very professional about it. And as such, I think the dynamic will be very cool. I think it'll be all right because I don't think, you know, Lewis will be going there thinking, oh, I'm going to blow Charles Leclerc away. He's not that stupid. And equally, Charles not going to say, I'm going to, you know, destroy Lewis Hamilton. There'll be a lot of mutual respect. And I think the other point is that they're both quite mature human beings, emotionally mature and spiritually mature, if that's the right word. And I think they'll both... I think it'll be a very well-run team, bearing in mind Freddie Vasseur is the guy at the top now, and he's got a lot of feeling for Lewis, and I think he's got a lot of feeling for Charles now because otherwise he wouldn't have signed him on that long-term contract. So I think I think it'll be quite – I think it'll be okay. I think it'll be okay. I mean, yeah, if it's three races to go in the championship and they're running one-two in the championship, they're one point apart and Max is only 10 points behind, obviously there's a massive amount of pressure – and at that moment, you'll probably see Lewis and Charles racing, you know, racing really hard against one another. That's what teammates do. You can't expect any teammates in the world, if they're any good, to be really good friends and to have what the media seem to want, which is, you know, really nice team. They all get on. They're all mates. You know, that's just fantasy land. And the only time you really have two drivers getting on is when one of them is inferior to the other and knows it. And uh, and they're just well balanced. And, and that's what, you know, that's what a lot of the good number one drivers want. So it's an interesting one. And, and I, you know, going back to your question, I see it a bit like Reutemann Villeneuve. I think there's a lot of respect. There was a lot of mutual respect then. And Gilles was a bit shocked at how quick Carlos was. Carlos was very taken by how good Gilles was day in, day out, and how enthusiastic he was. And I think there'll be that sort of feel to Ferrari in terms of the dynamic between the two drivers. It's a really good shout, Peter. And again, if I'm putting my Lewis Hamilton cap on, I've argued that I think Lewis Hamilton, and this isn't me saying that George is a better driver than Charles, just that he causes, he poses a completely different set of problems aside from absolute pace, which is Charles' biggest strength. So I think Lewis going into next year will sleep a lot easier knowing that he's dealing with Charles, who's very, very quick, as mm. versus George, who's a, an, an absolute killer in every sense, right or wrong, Peter? Well, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, if you go back to that incident at Zandvoort, the famous incident at Zandvoort, when George defied team orders and came in for the new set of tyres in, in the pit lane when they are going through the pit lane, I can't see Charles doing that sort of thing at Ferrari. He doesn't do that sort of thing. You know, he, yeah, he shout and, shouts and screams when he's not very happy about the strategy and what's, what they're doing, but he doesn't actually just, you know, do his own thing for the glory of Charles Leclerc. And and I think Lewis is the same. He's always been the same as that. You know, he's always been correct. And and I think that's why one of the reasons I think ethically they'll be very 
similar. And I think that that's a very strong point. And I think the, a lot of it depends, obviously, on how the for, how the Italian Ferrari media encase them and present them and who they want to who they like and who they don't like. I think they'll be charmed by Lewis in the same way they were charmed by Nigel when he went there. And I think they are charmed by Charles. I think they know, they all know how good Charles is. And so it's a charming team, if you like, in that sense. And that's not very unusual for Ferrari, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a good shout. Talk to me, Peter. I, I understand that there are a couple different reasons, uh, push factors or pull factors even, as far as why Lewis has made the jump. One of which is a lack of ambassadorial role that Mercedes weren't prepared to offer him that Ferrari are going to offer him post-retirement. Secondly, the multi-year contract. So Mercedes are giving him a one-year deal with an option for a, a second year. What Lewis wanted was a, a two-year deal with an option for a second year. Ferrari have given him that. Um, and then and then the branding thing uh, uh, and then... Uh, an investment, a perpetual investment in Lewis's kind of charitable things. And they had big money here, Peter, in that. So I think it was like 55, 60 million at Mercedes, 80 million euros now, of which 20 million is going towards Lewis's charitable projects. Um, Peter, which of those, if you're Lewis Hamilton, kind of um, is, is the deal clincher? Which of those means that, right, I have to make this move in addition to the lure of, of Scuderia Ferrari, do you think? I don't think it was any of those, Cam. I think it was, I want to do this. And this is what I'm getting. Beat it and I'll do the deal. And and they, they've beaten it. And it's, you know, if you're Ferrari, it's not difficult to beat any deal that is on the table from another team. And that's what they've done. They've basically just increased it in every area. Uh, increase the offer that Mercedes were making him. But ultimately, it was Lewis wanting to go, to go to Ferrari and just have a change of scenery and breathe different air for the good of being a very good racing driver and enjoying his, his craft. And, and it's that. Yeah, you can measure it in terms of all those numbers and the extension to the contract and all that, but I don't think any of those would have just been, oh, well, in that case, yeah, I've got a two-year deal. I'm going to go. Otherwise, I would have stayed at Mercedes and that. It would have been, I want to do this, but it's got to be right. This is what I'm on. Make me a better offer and I'll do it. And that's how he would have presented it, in my opinion. Wow, and it is big news, Mr. Windsor. It's, it feels like a rising tide as far as the... Um, the news beat has, has kind of floated all F1 ships. How, how big in history in terms of transfers is this move, Peter, when you rank it alongside, I don't know, Prost going across the Ferrari and Lewis jumping ship from McLaren to Mercedes. Is this the biggest one yet? Because it certainly feels like it if you're talking social media at all. Uh, yeah, I guess Etten Senna going from McLaren to Williams was pretty big, wasn't Oof. it? Given how you know how embedded he was at McLaren and how well he got on with everybody, I know they were going into a bit of a slump at that point. But you know, it wouldn't have been surprising had Ayrton decided to stay at McLaren, but he went to Williams. Frank just kept pushing and pushing until he agreed to go, and he had the, the Renault engine, and you know that was attractive to him. I think you know that's that's one of the biggest you can think of. I mean, obviously Fangio jumping from Mercedes to Ferrari and then to Maserati in the space of three years, enforced by Mercedes' withdrawal at the end of 55. But you know, that was, I mean, Fangio drove a lot of different teams. So if you want to look at a driver jumping and chopping and changing, you look at one manual Fangio. Um, I think, you know, in the case of Lewis, I think the interesting thing about Lewis is, is announcing it at the start of the year. And, and I've been thinking about that because... I mean, the alternative, obviously, is to announce it in September or whenever. And at that point, of course, they're quite far down the road in terms of confidentiality with the driver they think is going to be staying on. And I'm putting aside here the date on which Lewis had, obviously, to uh, exercise that option, putting that off, off the table for a second. But I'm just going through the, the basic feeling of whether it's better to announce it at the beginning of a year or the end of a year. And it's, and I think because of the way Formula One is today, and you've got so much, so many NDAs and so much uh, intellectual property right and so many long term contracts and so much gardening leave, how does a driver actually 
work through that in terms of making a sudden change from one team to another if you're a Lewis Hamilton. And if you think about it, this is about the only way you can do it because if he, if it was September, it would be very difficult for him to go to Ferrari, or difficult for Mercedes, difficult for Lewis to go to Ferrari with the amount of information that we have in his head about the new car. That's what, you know, one of the issues. And yeah, I mean, obviously there was a there was an option there to be exercised, and I think it's a it's a good clear thing that it was exercised before the start of the year. And the, and the, of course, the implication now is that Lewis will not have much information that he can take to Ferrari, and that's how will that affect his performance this year? That's another interesting question. We've never really seen this situation in Formula One before to this extent. And I, you know, it'll be interesting. I suspect it won't because Lewis probably never cared too much about that stuff anyway and just wants to get in and drive the race car. But, you know, it might. It might. It's a weird one, isn't it, Peter? We're in this kind of weird halfway house purgatory thing. I'm so keen to see what the dynamic is between George and Lewis this year because George was always trying to push on strategically and, and eke out every split second of advantage via strategy changes or tech like he's just got that he's that way as far as a racing driver mm. uh, are we going to see a situation where i know toto was said to the contrary but are we going to see surely toto wolf as a team principal has to prioritize george as the driver that's staying on the next one that's supposed to take mercedes to the promised land are they going to be are we going to hear a lot of bono saying lewis george is faster than you no, I don't think so. No, I think I don't. Th I think the media might like want that to happen because it's a great story. But I, I don't think that'll happen any more than we've seen it happening. Obviously, if there's a situation where George is on a new set of tyres and Lewis is on an old set of tyres and the usual thing, let him pass different strategy and vice versa. But until if, you know, until they're absolutely in the running for the championship, I don't think you'll get if they're on the same set of tyres at the same moment, exactly an equal performance that the team will tell George to move over or vice versa. I don't think that'll happen. I think, you know, the, a lot of the media like to think about that and that there'll be, there'll be favoritism. I don't think there will be. I mean, it'll take care of itself because George will be a much more integrated member of the team now than Lewis because Lewis won't be very integrated. But I think in a way that's to Lewis's advantage in terms of the way he's going to race against uh, George because George knows now that he's got to deliver in 2024. He's got to assert himself as the new megastar for Mercedes for the next 10 years, if he wants. That's presumably what George wants in his own mind, I would imagine. And to have other team, new teammates come in, maybe come, maybe go. But he, George Russell, is going to be the guy. When Mercedes come back, he's going to be the guy that wins world championships with him. And Lewis, meanwhile, will be just chilled out, relaxed. Yeah, OK, no worries, George. Yeah. And then he'll just focus on his driving, be super quick. And every time he's within a tenth of George, or maybe a tenth, it's going to wind up George much more than it would normally. Because here's this guy, he's leaving the team, he's quite relaxed, and he's blowing him away. And that's what Lewis will be trying to do, obviously, winding him up that way by being very relaxed, very casual. Apparently, they're getting on really well. That's uh, Make it apparent, even if they're not. And and just relax. And I think he will. I think he'll, I think he'll be super quick, Lewis, this year. I think you'll see him driving incredibly well. Oh. That and that Lewis that you described, the flow state, relaxed, calm, happy-go-lucky Lewis is a very dangerous racing driver, right? One yeah. of the quickest that we've ever seen in, yeah. in F1 history. So good luck yeah. beating that chap, George, or anyone else, if he's got a car underneath him, mate. Big yeah, end. and it'll infuriate George because George will be, all of a sudden him in this new world of Mercedes and George Russell. And in his mind, he's probably thinking, well, it will give me an advantage over Lewis. He's probably yeah. not taking that for granted, but he's probably thinking, yeah, well, it should, shouldn't it? And if it doesn't, and it's not, and Lewis is still right there, then it's gonna, then the pressure is going to mount on George. And it, it'll be up to Toto to handle that. And if his vision for the future is, I don't know, George Russell, Kimi Antonelli, and that's his, that's his vision, long-term vision for the future, he's going to need to make sure that George you know, stays on the straight and narrow in terms of his, in terms of feeling stable within the team and, and get, and gets the best from himself and doesn't get too wound up if Lewis is going quickly, which I think he will. Go on then, Peter, you segue beautifully onto the future and potentially the next Mercedes driver with your insider information and your, your not insubstantial F1 knowledge, Peter. Hmm. Again, betting man. 
who's the next F1 driver uh, after the next Mercedes F1 driver? Well, I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that, Cameron. <laughs> I, I'm always nervous when I have to listen and read everybody else's comments about another driver because quite often reality is very different from what everybody's saying. I've, I've never really seen Kimi Antonelli drive, so I can't really comment on him apart from what you know and I know, which is that everybody seems to think he's the next out in the centre. So... First of all, thinking down that path, I doubt Mercedes would run him in 25 in Formula One. They'll probably need to find a sort of stopgap driver to get him through one year. Maybe, maybe they'll run Mick, somebody like that, or maybe they'll go for somebody very seasoned, somebody like Perez, or maybe if they can get Alonso, uh, you know, Alonso maybe. Um, but you know, Antonelli, they would run in 26, I would imagine. I mean, bearing in mind, he's going from Formula 4 to Formula 2 straight away. I mean, it's a big jump as it is. And so that's one point. If, I mean, putting aside that and just thinking generally, you'd have to say that Oscar Piastri would be a guy that they should be looking at. And But I assume, I assume Zach's got him massively tied down. But he has signed... Lando to this long-term contract. And if, if I was Zach, which I'm not, I would be prepared to release Oscar for a lot of money to Mercedes on the basis that I want to give, A, I'd make some money out of it, and B, Lando, I could then get a driver who's perhaps a bit more compatible for getting the best from Lando. Because I think Oscar's super quick, and I'm not sure that's ever going to bring the best out in Lando. The same way that, you know, George maybe didn't bring the best out in, in Lewis in the old situation. So if I, you know, you look at maybe running sites again alongside Lando at McLaren, for example, that would be quite a good combination again, I think, uh, instead of Oscar there. And you let Oscar go to Mercedes. Um, so that, that would be another guy that you would look at. Pierre Gasly, maybe. I think his stock is rising amongst the sort of, you know, guys on the pit wall who don't really watch too much but look at numbers. He does seem to be pretty quick. You know, it, it's usually Gasly who's qualifying quite well, putting in the lap, doesn't seem to race that well. Uh, Ocon seems to race just as well, if not slightly better, probably in terms of consistency. But, but Gasly is quick. So he's another guy they might look at, I would think. But... Um, yeah, I mean, how are they going to evaluate Kimi Antonelli? That's the question, because the system seems to be very results-based. And yes, he's gone very well so far. Now he's in Formula 2 with Prema alongside Oliver Berman, who should win the championship. So how are they going to value that with, with Kimi and how good he is? I mean, Oliver, Oliver's really good as well. I and mean, he doesn't have a slot now at Ferrari, obviously. So he's a guy that also maybe. Mercedes could buy from Ferrari. But then why would they do that if they've got Antonelli? They probably wouldn't. Um, so it's an interesting one. It's a really interesting one. And you, I don't, I'm not sure the compatibility of who would go with George comes into it. I think they'll try and get the best guy they can, whether it be a young, young, very, very quick driver or whether it be a Fernando Alonso at the back end of his career, who's also very, very good, of course. So I, they'll just try and get the best guy they can, I think, obviously. It's going to be very interesting. The old musical chairs of F1 has commenced. Peter, let me pitch this yeah. at you. Um, I, I think that the romantic in me hopes that Kimi Antonelli is everything that people say, is that he's going to potentially blitz F2 in his maiden year, a feat that only George and, and Charles have done before, I think Lewis as well. Um, and I think Toto will... <laughs> I think he'll have a plug. I think he'll have a placeholder. So p picture this. I think Carlos, I imagine Carlos might go to Salva in anticipation of, of Audi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bottas jumps across as the plug for a couple of years whilst Kimi Antonelli gets his eye in. And then Toto promotes Kimi Antonelli straight to the Lewis seat and looks like an absolute genius because he's got him at cheaper money. He's potentially the next Lewis or Max, however you want to put it and looks like an absolute genius. Whereas now Lewis fans are looking at Toto like he's completely made a humongous mistake and that could be very different in 24 months time, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe looks like a genius in the eyes of the media, but don't forget team owners, team principals tend to want to pay a massive amount of money for drivers. They don't really like getting young guys and paying them nothing and having on 20-year contracts. Yeah. They love to be able to sit down to dinner and say, I've just paid 
77 million for this guy is and I a megastar. I think that's more what they're into. So I don't think there's any of that sort of finding a young guy, aren't we superstar geniuses anymore? Um, I don't know. I mean, they've got there's a, there's a lot of talent out there. And Frederick Vesti is very good. I mean, he people talk about Berman, but he took it to Berman. Okay, it was his Berman was his rookie season, but we shouldn't forget Vesti and how good he is. Short corner driver, very very um, systematic in the way he goes racing, and it's very easy to sort of drop a few cliches here and there and say, oh well, you know, maybe he's not up to it or whatever. I think he's really good. I think Mick Schumacher, if managed well could be very good as well. And, and so both of those would should be in the frame as well, no doubt. And I don't know. I think, as you mentioned, Beltri Bottas, I'd be surprised if they get him back. I think he's, you know, he'll be at Audi until they kind of, you know, he just naturally goes away. I mean, would they bring him back? Maybe, maybe. I don't know how quick he'd be these days. You know, he's just... He's as quick as Guan Yajou, isn't he? Yeah, true, true. <laughs> he, but, a bit of a, but he, he kind of meets the criteria, though, Peter. Of a, a, he's like the perfect stopgap. He's like well, a, they don't a want place. a stopgap. They want the really. They want the quickest stopgap they can get. It's a difference between a stopgap and a very, control. very quick stopgap, isn't yeah. there? And you know, I'm not sure Valtteri is. I mean, maybe they will. I mean, oh yeah, he knows the sim. He knows this. He knows that. Maybe they'll do that, but. Yeah. I don't see George Russell, Valtteri Bottas as a massively strong driver combination. Do you? No, at all. Not <laughs> even. Not even. It's a, it is a placeholder at best. And as we round yeah. third base, I, mean, I would, I would, I'd rather take a plunge on if he's available. I'd take take a plunge. I'd, if it was that, you'd take a plunge on Antonelli. I would have thought, or Vesti, or or uh, or Mick. That's that's where we're headed. I think Peter. I think if Toto's had his Weetabix and got his strategic decision making cap on, I think. It will be one of those. And to that point, Peter, mm. um, we've just we've mentioned Behrman, Vesti, Martins is is about, Arthur Leclerc is about as well. There's all of a sudden we find ourselves with a plethora of promising drivers, but only 20 seats. Peter, talk to me about the decision to not allow Andretti on the grid in 2026 uh, how how did you react to that in the first instance and and how did it make you feel more broadly about f1's uh tendency to gatekeep oh, i was well i couldn't believe it actually to be honest i had to read it twice i thought no this can't be right. this is a real press release so it didn't actually come through in the normal format of a of an FIA media press release, even though it was from the FIA. It was, it was all different sort of font and everything looked slightly odd. And I was reading and I was, this is unbelievable. Is this a real thing? And it was, and it was. And I just, I'm still staggered, to be honest. I think it's, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an own goal. There's no other way of describing it really, is there? Because here they are trying to promote Formula One in the United States like crazy, underwriting races, putting on races all across the continent. I'm mean, exaggerating slightly, but you know what I'm what I'm saying. And here we have the opportunity to have an American, a proper American team in Formula One actually building its car in America. So it's a proper team. And it's the Andretti name as well. And they're saying no. <laughs> and they've even done their engine deal for 26. I mean, it's just the most bizarre thing. And I, But I mean, sadly, I had been predicting this. And I was, I was just hoping that I was wrong and that somehow... They were able to say to the teams, doesn't matter what you guys think, we own this sport, we are going to let Andretti come in, go away and keep quiet. But they didn't. The teams ultimately made the decision, and that is we don't want the slice of our cake to be any smaller. It's small enough as it is with the budget cap, I suppose, is what a lot of them are saying. So um, I don't know. I'm just I'm flabbergasted now. And I think it's I think it's one thing to say, you know, we we considered it. And at the moment, we don't think it's right, but we're really looking forward to looking at this again in 28 in a very positive way, rather than having to read all the small print. And to congratulate Andretti, Andretti to do, on doing a great job and how, how they would like to work with Andretti over the next couple of years to see if they could generate more money for the team to help them in their next application to Formula One. And in the meantime, Mario should be made a, you know, a, 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 a grand marshal of Formula One or whatever you want to call him. And Michael's invited to go to all the races and do press conferences. If it was like that, I would think, well, yeah, I can kind of 
accept this but it wasn't it was you know we think andretti need formula one and formula one needs andretti and we don't think the car will be competitive and lots of really stuff that should not have been put out in my view and quite insulting to the andretti name and to the andretti family and who are they to say who are they to judge whether the andretti name or the formula one name is bigger and who needs which more? Who, who, how can anybody put themselves in that position to make that judgment? It's, uh, it's completely wrong to do that because Andretti is an integral part of the sport and we wouldn't have the Formula One we have today if it wasn't for drivers like Mario Andretti. That is an absolute fact. So to say that Formula One doesn't really need the Andretti name as much as they need Formula One is just ridiculous. And think of what Mario did for Formula One, when he jumped into Didier Peroni's car at Monza in 82 and put it on the pole, he's returned to Ferrari. What he did for Ferrari, for Italy, what he did for Formula One. And to say that, let alone, you know, winning the championship with, with Colin Chapman and all the other stuff he did, uh, it's just, and he's a crossover driver as well. I mean, he's won the Indy 500 and the Formula One World Championship. He's an absolute jewel in the crown for Formula One because that is... You know, the ultimate American racing driver. And, and they're slapping him in the face. <laughs> you know, that's Mario. People say, oh, well, it's son Michael. But it's all the same. You know, it's all the family. And, and it's wrong. In my view, it's completely wrong. Peter, allow me to play devil's advocate for a second. Mm. Because if, if F1, I completely agree with everything you said, by mm. the way. The tone, particularly of the press release, was, was talking in all these ad value terms. And it's very, mm. it felt, and read very gatekeepy to me. But if I play devil's advocate for a second, if F1 is a business, there that it, then there is a price, right? And I think they term that the dilution fee. There is a price to pay. And according to the, the most up-to-date Concord, which is no longer up-to-date, that dilution fee is anywhere between 200 and 250 million US dollars. Now, we know that, that because of a, a, a variety of factors, COVID and... Um, 2021 season which was super which was blockbuster and did massive things for the sport netflix drive to survive the push of social media liberty have done a fantastic job that f1 in 2024 is a very different business proposition and and 200 million is probably let's say anywhere between four and 500 million shy of what the dilution fee should be so it with that in mind peter um if they'd come back and said, listen, at, at the next Concord agreement, we're, we're happy with your proposition, Andretti, but the 200 million dilution fee is about, f- about four or 500 million shy of where it should be in 2024 with inflation and interest rates and whatever. If they come back and said, we're good to go in 2026, 27, but the fee isn't 200 million, it's going to be six or 700 million. Peter, mm-hmm. what, how would you respond? Would that have changed your reaction somewhat? No, I think it's, I I would just reiterate what I've been saying, which is that they should, in reality, they should be saying, we think that around the Andretti name, the team can probably raise the 600 that would make it really comfortable. And we'd like to work closely with Andretti over the next four years to make that happen. Why wouldn't wouldn't that be a logical thing to do? To market the Andretti name as part of Formula One to generate that 600 million so that when they come into Formula One, they do it in a five-star way. Where's the downside in that? Why would they just say, oh, well, you can't come in? How, How easy do you think it will be now for Andretti to go out into the marketplace and sell that proposition? Oh, well, we've raised 200, but now we want to raise 600. What are the Wall Streeters going to say? Oh, well, you've been rejected. You can't do that. Forget it. Yeah. <laughs> they basically killed the opportunity to go out and sell the name now. Wow. That's the problem. They should have been really positive about it. If they wanted to delay it, if they wanted to just make sure that they got everybody on board and we'll start from 26 or whatever it is, 28, give Andretti an opportunity. I mean, these opportunities don't come along very often. The Gurney name is pretty big in America. The Andretti name is huge, given what they're doing at the moment. What else is there? That is the name that they need to be out there marketing. Should be part of Formula One already. Yeah, it's all very gatekeepy, isn't it, Peter? But I, and again, I suppose the flip side of of, of where we are is that um, there are some very um, senior key stakeholders in the tip, the likes of Horner and 
um, Dietrich's son that they've got to manage. And if, if Andretti has done anything to cheese these guys off by being a bit bullish and getting his elbows out in, in trying to kind of force the likes of Horner and Marku and, and Toto to kind of bend the knee and, and be very accepting of Andretti, then sadly for Andretti, these guys are going to do the reverse, right? They're going to get their elbows out and massively gate keep the sport well, that they're so... Yeah, but that, that's just a question, as I say, it's just a question of the financial cake and the teams yeah. having smaller slices. But if you said to Michael or Mario or anybody involved in this, how do you want to go motor racing? They would say the logical thing. We want to start small, we want to walk, and then we want to trot, and then we want to run, and then we want to gallop. And they would do it in a logical way. And And... Formula One, as I've said all along, the teams are always going to be resistant to that. And that's, that's so therefore, it's the, the commercial rights owners, it's the FIA that need to get control of the situation and make sure we're not rejecting really, really good opportunities for the sport purely because of this ridiculous franchise system that the teams now have that is, it's, it's on paper, it's a massive amount of money, but actually the world is not about money it's about people and it's about spirit and it's about sport and it's about ethics and it's about doing things that are correct and i can tell you now ethically this is not correct to be kicking andretti into touch at this point given the amount of money they've already raised and given the success that michael's had in other forms of racing peter do you put any stock in um that there's a rumor i don't know how, how fact or fiction this is but there's a rumor that the FOM weren't too happy that they pinged Mario an email saying that they wanted to have this face-to-face -face meeting to discuss the proposition and kind of go through it in some, in some forensic detail. Um, and Andretti, or the source at least, says that Andretti didn't pick up the email. It went into the spam and they didn't respond to the FOM. Do, do, you, do you put any stock in that rumour? Uh, well, if that happened and I was with FOM, I would have followed it up. And I would have got on a plane and gone over to Nazareth, Pennsylvania to Absolutely. see reality. I wouldn't have just waited to uh, <laughs> not reply to an email. I mean, <laughs> there seems to be a standard thing in Formula One these days, and that is that if you don't reply to an email or to a WhatsApp or to a text or whatever, it actually is a message in itself. It's saying, I don't want to talk to you. And that, that that's a bit of an irony, isn't it? Given that the internet is there to make us all communicate in a much more efficient way than we've ever had before. And I say this because I heard not so long ago that one of the Formula One teams, and I won't mention the name, but a friend of mine was actually doing a sponsorship deal with one of the current Formula One teams. And it was going quite far down the road to the point where he was having dinner with the family of the chief marketing director of this Formula One team, the guy who was handling the sponsorship deal. And they were having dinner, everything went well, and they met one another's family. And as the guy was being shown out, um, and the deal was probably two weeks away potentially from being signed, and it was not mega, but you know, we're talking several million, obviously. The, the Formula One marketing guy said to my friend, oh, by the way, um, if we stop replying to your emails, you know the deal's off. And my but he said, well, I hope that we would, we've got a good enough communication route now that if there were things going off the rails, you'd tell me about it and we could talk about it. He said, well, no, it's just company policy. That's the way we handle things. <laughs> he rang me up the next day. He said, is this right? What the hell's going on? He's an American, I've got to tell you. And, um, and the only thing I can think of is that the teams today, probably, probably other entities, commercial entities throughout the world, exactly the same thing. It's probably a legal requirement now from all these ridiculous law firms they all employ with massive, massive amount of money that's spent on them. And the legal advice is if you're deciding not to go ahead with the deal, don't write anything or say anything because it could be used against you if the other side wants to take you to court. So just say nothing at all. <laughs> you know, so maybe if, if we're going back to the Andretti thing, if FOM did send this email and if it did get lost in spam maybe they thought oh well formula one system they're not replying obviously they don't want to do this so we'll give them the easy way out we'll just tell them they can't have an entry <laughs> if that's the case then the world's in a very sad place isn't it Jeez, peter this is bonkers makes me feel very sad all this i, I always i feel like this is a, a common thread that runs through our chats of late i, I always end up being like well finding <laughs> for years and, and, and seasons gone by because it's, it's, that's not a good way of, no. of working, is it? 
That's no, it's not. And it's not a good way of working. And there's a lot of shouting and screaming. There's a lot of ego. And guess what? It's all due to yeah, yeah. M-O-N-E-Y. It's all caused by money. And if, yes, there were political dramas when there was less money around. Yes, the safety was terrible. Yes, there were a lot of other logistics dramas. And there were so many things that were wrong. But everybody went racing ultimately because they wanted to go racing. And even if they were earning no money at all, they still wanted to be at the next race. And the minute you bring a massive amount of money into an industry and you have commercial rights holders and everybody's only interested in growing the sport and the word stakeholders, you know, um, is it's uh, to me, it's a rocky road to what you've just described, Cameron, to feeling a bit depressed and a bit unhappy about the way the way the world is because money is just it's just a currency it's just a it's just a convenience it's not not a goal it's not an end goal at all uh, it's not in any way a substitute for the feeling a driver can get if he's just put together the ultimate pole lap or a team owner can have if he has plucked a young guy out of karting and put him into formula 3 and he goes straight into formula 1 and he's super quick in his third race, second race, first race, that those feelings, those human emotions are ultimately what our sport is all about. And, and we are mixing them now in a way that we've never done before with massive amounts of money and huge business interests. And that's why people like yourself who are passionate and love our sport, that's why you're feeling discombobulated now. You know, I've, I've been around long enough kind of to accept it because I'm not surprised by anything anymore. And I grew up in the Bernie Max era and there were a lot of things not right with that either. So I'm kind of, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a cynic, but I've kind of seen it all. So nothing surprises me anymore. And, but I think if we all use Formula One as a microcosm of the real world, you can see why we have so much trouble in the world today in general. Oh, Peter, the romanticism. It is is dying from sport. No, I'm not even going to point the the my uh, scopes just the F1. Right, I feel like it's happening in sports globally just a little bit. And although we've got lots to be optimistic about from an F1 perspective going forward, I do feel like it is um, it's a very different proposition. And F1 as an entity is very different from in, in two zero two four from even in the late. 80s right when i started watching and that that concerns me ever so slightly but you know what they'll, they'll say that well, I'm a lot of money out there cameron that's that should yeah. make you happy <laughs> yeah yeah money is the root of all yeah Beautiful, exactly isn't it peter exactly. but um i digress i digress mate you've been super generous with your time peter no, I, no problem always a pleasure to I, talk cameron always a pleasure i enjoy these thoroughly each and every single time we'll end it there and, and you know what peter it's um the irony that we end talking about romanticism and that it's lost and started off talking about romantic the romanticism associated with lewis hamilton moving across the red car is kind of it, it's it ties a bow in all of this very neatly i think peter you've been an absolute legend well thank you cameron and just let me I've, I've told this story on on my live stream but i'll tell it again and i think it puts everything into perspective because whether you know much about him or not there is no doubt jim clark was one of the greatest grand prix drivers of all time and you won't find many formula one people who won't agree with that statement and yet in 1966, when he was invited to go to a British racetrack called Snetterton in the rain in the winter to drop the chequered flag at the end of a touring car race or whatever, he was with a group of friends, not racing that, that day. He was with a group of friends who were trying to, who, who, who were eating and drinking in the Duckham's, or Duckham's oil uh, marquee. They said, oh, Jim, come in, you know, a cup of tea, have a glass of wine or whatever, or Coke. And he wouldn't go in because he hadn't had a formal invitation from Duckham's, even though he was a double world champion by then. And he said, no, it wouldn't be right. I haven't got my invite. You guys enjoy yourself. I'll, I'll go and get a cup around the corner with, you know, in the canteen and went off and bought a cup of tea for himself in the canteen. And that, that charm and that, that correctness is something I think we should preserve. And, you know, there were better ways of saying to the Andretti's, you're not, going to get an entry into Formula One. And if you, if you see Jim Clark's behaviour in the context of the way the Andrettis were handled, I think, you know, it just shows the way the world has changed, isn't it? 
Peter, I love those anecdotes, mate, and and you you sum it up very eloquently, better than I ever could. Peter, you've been a That's legend. Not true, but anyway, thank you very behave much, Cam. Yourself, behave, Peter. There is there are levels to this eloquence and articulation game, and I'm I'm nowhere near. One day, Peter, if I keep learning and picking up, <laughs> you do tips, a very good job. Congratulations. <laughs> I appreciate you. Do me a favour subscribers peddlers if you're not subscribed to the peter d wins a youtube channel what are you doing with your life go and do that now peter has a podcast out called the short corners that is on spotify all good podcasting platforms you can go and have a listen to that fantastic platform platform fantastic podcast go and take a listen if you're listening on a podcasting platform Drop a review, helps the channel massively. If you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Until next time, remember to look, but never stare.